In this video, we're going to derive the heat conduction equation in Cartesian coordinates. We're going to make use of Fourier's law of conduction to account for conduction heat transfer in and out of the control volume that we're going to use. We're going to allow for changes of energy with in time within the control volume, and we're going to allow for the conversion of other forms of energy into thermal energy within the volume. In order to carry out this analysis, we're going to have to apply conservation of energy to a Cartesian control volume. So here's our Cartesian control volume. It has dimensions of dx in the x direction, dy in the y direction, and dz in the z direction. The coordinate system, the origin, is located at the center of the control volume, and the six faces are located an equal distance away from the, from the origin. So, for example, if we start at the origin and we move a distance dx over 2 in the x direction, we come across this face that I've labeled the x plus face. And that is the face which has a normal in the x direction and is located a positive distance dx over 2 away from the origin. If we move backwards a distance of dx over 2, we'll come across the x minus face, or the, the face which has a normal in the x direction and which is located a distance minus dx over 2 from the origin. Similarly, we have the y plus and y minus faces in the y direction and the z plus and z minus faces in the z direction. We'll apply conservation of energy to our control volume and we're going to allow for conduction heat transfer in our volume, which will enter and exit through the faces of our control volume. We'll allow for changes in time, uh, and we'll allow for conversion of other forms of energy into thermal energy uh, within the control volume. The basic equation for this conservation of our energy is the energy, the rate of change which energy is stored in the volume is equal to the rate which energy comes in minus the rate which energy comes out through the faces of the volume, plus any amount of energy that was converted from another form of energy into thermal energy within the control volume. Each of these terms, of course it's a rate of energy, so joules per second, which is our units of watts. Each of these terms is in units of watts. And the rate that energy is converted to thermal energy from other forms of energy is termed uh, the energy generation inside the volume. But you should always remember that, of course, energy is conserved and it was some other form of energy which was converted into thermal energy inside that volume. So let's start with the storage term. In order to evaluate the storage term, we have to define another uh, property of a, of a material, and that property is the volumetric heat capacity. It's the density times the heat capacity to make it the volumetric heat capacity, and that is a property which has units of joules per meter cubed Kelvin. And so that tells you it's the amount of energy in joules that you have to put into a cubic meter of that material in order to raise its temperature by one degree Kelvin or one degree Celsius since the, the size of a degree Kelvin and Celsius is the same. You could write this as Celsius as well but it's much more commonly uh, tabulated as Kelvin. And so with that definition for our volumetric heat capacity then we can come up with an equation for the rate that energy is stored within our volume. It's the volumetric heat capacity, so we have to multiply by the volume, or dx, dy, dz. And we need to talk about a rate of change of temperature with time. Dividing by time will give us units of watts, and multiplying by a change in temperature that will tell us how much energy was required to change the material's volume by that temperature. Here's an expression for energy storage, this volumetric heat capacity times the time derivative of temperature multiplied by the volume. So we're starting to develop our equation. We've developed the, the first term, the rate of change of energy within the volume. Next we'll look at the energy generation term as it's relatively straightforward. So having defined this constant value of the volumetric heat generation within our volume, uh, we can simply multiply that by the volume of our, of our control volume in order to get this term for the, the amount of watts that are generated by energy that is converted from another form into thermal energy inside our volume. An example of how that might happen is perhaps there's an electric current moving through the material and the resistances are resulting in a heat generation. Uh, it could be that there's a chemical reaction happening and chemical energy is being converted to thermal energy. But for our purposes, we will simply rely on knowing that there is a constant uh, thermal generation within the volume. 
So here's our equation up to this point. We have our storage term. We have now our generation term. And we have left to look at this rate that energy enters the faces of the control volume by conduction uh, minus the energy that leaves the faces of the control volume by conduction. Next we'll look at this term and in order to do that we have to look at our control volume again and we're looking at these terms where energy is being conducted through in this case the y plus phase. And I remind you that we can talk about our the heat that's being transferred either in units of watts, where we call it the heat rate. So Q is the heat rate in watts, and it is equal to the heat flux, which is in watts per meter squared, times the area of the face. And so the total heat rate out this Y plus face is the heat flux out the Y plus face, times the area of the face, which is dx times dz. Similarly, we look at the face out the uh, X plus face, and I've chosen these directions arbitrarily, but as long as we apply them correctly in our E in versus E out in our conservation of energy equation, um, we will get the right answer. So we need to describe these, and there's a little bit of a challenge there as we know things at the center, and we want to evaluate them at these faces. Well, we have a tool for uh, con calculating what the value of some variable is at, an, at one point if we know it at another, and those are Taylor series expansions. So if I know the value of the heat flux at my origin, um, and I want to know what, there it is at my origin, Q double prime X, and I want to know what the value of Q double prime X plus is, that is the value on this X plus face, I can apply a Taylor series expansion to say that it is equal to the value at the center, plus the rate of change of that variable with respect to x times the distance that I move to get from the center to this face, which is dx over 2. And of course, I could carry on giving higher and higher order terms. Hot see, higher order terms of a Taylor series expansion. But for our purposes, we will take just the first term of this and say that it is approximately equal to the value at the center plus the rate of change as we move to a face times the distance that we've moved to get to that face. And so I can apply that to all six faces of my control volume. I've done this in this table. If we look at the x plus face, it's clear that the face area is dy times dz, and that will apply equally to the x minus face. In the y plus face, the area is dx times dz, and that of course is the same for the y minus face. And in the z faces, the area is dx times dy. The heat flux moving to the x plus face is in the positive direction, and so we have q double prime of x plus the rate of change in the x direction times the distance dx over 2. For the negative face, we're moving in the negative dx over 2 direction, uh, moving in the negative direction a distance dx over 2, and so this is our expression for the heat flux at the x minus face. And similarly in the y and z face, uh, we are moving in the y and z direction respectively by a distance dy or dz over 2. And so to get the, the value of the heat flux that enters, the way I've drawn this, on the minus faces, we have the heat flux entering the control volume. So if we look at the X term, for example, uh, the rate that, enter, that energy is entering is QX minus D, DQ double prime X DX over 2 times the area. And I have leaving the control volume by conduction the term on the x plus face, similar for y and z. And now I can begin to simplify these expressions. So I can add them together, or subtract one from the other, sorry. And we notice when we do that, that in each one of these terms, I have the flux at the middle minus the flux at the middle in each of my two directions. And in addition, I have the rate of change with respect to the coordinate direction times a minus dx over 2 and subtracted from that another minus dx over 2. So these will combine to give us a full dx similar in the y, similar in the z. You'll notice too that the rate of change in the x direction is multiplying a face area that has the y, the dy, and the dz. Similarly, the rate of change in the y direction multiplies an area that has dx and dz, 
and the rate of change in the z direction multiplies the face area with a dx and a dy which means that we will get the volume coming out of all of these terms when we collect our terms. And so we'll get minus the gradient or the derivative in the x direction of the x flux, the derivative in the y direction of the y flux, the derivative with respect to z of the z flux, all multiplied by the volume dx dy dz, dx dy dz, dx dy dz. There's our expression, the negative of these derivatives, and these, these derivatives are a, actually a special function. This is, in vector calculus, the gradient operator. <clears throat> gradient operator is, is written this way, nabla times the thing which is operating on. In this case, that thing that's operating on is the heat flux. And so we have the gradient operator, nabla, is the derivative with respect to x of whatever it's operating on plus the derivative with respect to y of whatever it's operating on plus the derivative with respect to z of whatever it's operating on. And so the term that we came up with is, of course, the gradient of the heat flux. Now, we need to evaluate the gradient of this heat flux. In order to do that, we're using Fourier's law of conduction. So if you recall, Fourier's law of conduction written for the heat flux vector is equal to minus k times the gradient of t. And of course, the heat flux is a vector in the Cartesian coordinate system with three dimensions. It has the x component in the y direction, the y component in the j direction, and the z component in the k direction. And so applying the definition of the gradient operator, I can see that the, the q double prime x, the heat flux in the x direction, is minus k dt dx and similarly for y and z. So we can substitute that into our uh, conservation of energy equation. We now had the Fourier's law applying qx, which was minus k dt dx. We know that the heat rate in the y direction is minus k dt dy, and similarly for the z, minus k dt dz. We already had each of these terms, uh, we already had the gradient of each of these terms, now that we've substituted that in, we can see that the negative sign will cancel with the negative sign uh, that was already existing in our equation. So simplifying that again, now we get this term here for the energy which is being conducted in and out, the sum of the energy in minus the energy out through all six faces of our control volume. So now we have all of the three terms that need to go into our conservation of energy equation and we can put it all together and we see we have our rate of energy rate of change of energy in the control volume the storage term we have the e in minus e out the rate that energy was conducted in minus the rate that energy is conducted out and the rate that energy is converted to thermal energy with within the volume and so this is our final uh, equation Now that we've done this, we can see that each one of these terms is, de is multiplying by the volume. And so we can, we can divide by the volume and get rid of these dx, dy's, dz's. So finally doing that, of course, I've now changed the notation to put three double primes here to say that it's per unit volume. So now the units on these terms are each going to be watts per meters cubed because we divided by the volume. And of course, our expression now has three terms each of which has units of watts per meter cubed. So this is our final equation uh, before any simplifications. It's the complete equation if we have all three of these mechanisms, conduction, uh, changes with time, and energy generation within the volume. And also we have the conductivity uh, of the, the thermal conductivity of the material appear, appearing inside these derivative operators. Next, we're going to look at some simplifications of these equations. And the first class of simplifications comes about by saying that the conductivity, the thermal conductivity, is constant. If the thermal conductivity is varying, we cannot pull it out from these gradient operators or from these derivative operators. But if it is a constant, we can pull out the k's out of these derivative operators and collect them. Once we've done that, we now notice another vector calculus operator appearing, 
this term here, the sum of the second derivatives of a scalar in each of the coordinate directions, is the Laplacian operator. This is the definition of the Laplacian operator here. And so we can simplify this greatly in vector notation to simply say the energy storage per unit volume is equal to the conduction in and out of the faces per unit volume plus the energy generation inside per unit volume. So there's the, the most general form with the assumption of a constant conductivity. But very often when we use a constant conductivity, we define another material property. And of course, I could divide that k through my equations to get rho Cp over k times the time derivative, no longer a k here, and q over k. And that allows me uh, to introduce the material property called the thermal diffusivity. So the thermal diffusivity is defined as the thermal conductivity over rho Cp, and it has units of meters squared per second. The thermal diffusivity is, an, is, is a property that speaks to the relative ease at which energy, thermal energy is conducted in a material versus being stored in a material. And if I substitute that into my equation, I will very often see the equation written in this form with the thermal diffusivity instead of the thermal conductivity uh, multiplying the storage term. Another simplification that we can make to the, a form of the equation that already has a constant conductivity is that there is no changes in time or the system is steady. And if there are no changes in time, then of course simply the energy storage term goes to zero and our equation uh, simplifies thusly. The next simple si simplification we can make to our form of equation that already has a constant conductivity is that there is no thermal energy generation or no energy being converted from another form into thermal energy. And of course, that means that this term is going to go to zero and we can get rid of the uh, final term in our equation. And so we'll be left with this expression with no generation term, but the other two terms still there. And finally, if it's steady and there's no generation, then we can get rid of both of these terms, this one storage term because it's steady and the final term because there's no generation and we're left with an expression uh, that says the conductivity times the Laplacian of temperature or this sum of the second derivatives of temperature with respect to each of the coordinate directions is equal to zero and of course we can divide that zero by k to eliminate the k and we're left only with this expression that the Laplacian of temperature is equal to zero. <coughs> And of course, notice once you've done this, our term now has units of kelvins per meter squared, uh, and we'll have to be calling as that when we're using an equation like this. All right, so to summarize, the most general equation that we can come up with for the cases that for the case that we have here, the heat diffusion equation in Cartesian coordinates with energy storage, conduction through our control volume faces, and thermal energy generation is written uh, like this. And likewise, the equation simplifies considerably when we have a constant conductivity. So if we just have a constant conductivity, that gives us this set of equations here. Where we still have energy storage and we still have thermal energy generation and we may or may not want to express uh, the equation using the thermal diffusivity instead of the conductivity and the volumetric heat capacity. If we have a constant conductivity and no generation, we get this expression, these expressions here. And finally, if we have constant thermal conductivity, no generation, and no changes in time, which is more concisely written as steady, then we simply get the Laplace the temperature is equal to zero. And so that's the heat diffusion equation in Cartesian coordinates with various simplifications. We could easily derive this in cylindrical or spherical coordinates, and in some problems that's a convenient thing to do. You may want to look up what the form of these equations is in cylindrical or spherical coordinates.
Of course, starting with the vector form of the equation, we can simply look up what the definition of the Laplacian is in cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates and substitute that in to get the equation that we want directly.